Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for attending our live webinar today. Our panel of seasoned Chug LLP attorneys will talk about critical corporate governance issues that companies should address during this uncertain environment that's created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our panelists today include Nishita Patel, partner and attorney in our Los Angeles office, Meng Shin Esther Kui, an attorney in our Reston, Virginia office, Min Wang, an attorney in our Los Angeles office, and Vikram Subramanian, an attorney based in our Santa Clara, California office. So let's get started. Min, for starters, could you explain what corporate governance is? Thank you, Sasha. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank everyone for being here today. It's a pleasure to discuss managing corporate governance issue. So corporate governance is setting the condition in which others manage effectively. It's the oversight of the entire company on behalf of owners or shareholders. As a general matter, the board's responsibility is to oversee the business and affairs of the company. This means that the board set the goals, policies, objectives, and the board also oversees that the management is executing these goals, policies, and objectives. Of course, during the time of COVID, the board may and should increase the level of oversight. First, the first step in disaster planning is to see if there is a crisis response plan. If there is a crisis response plan, the board should evaluate whether the plan is sufficient to address the pandemic and whether the plan should be modified. Due to the unique nature of COVID-19, the board should discuss any and all implementation issues with management and evaluate whether there's a need to modify the plan. It's important to narrow the plan specifically to the issue of COVID. Some of the things the board should consider when planning specifically for COVID is um, additional steps that might be required if the impact of COVID is prolonged, the feasibility of implementing these steps under different scenarios, um, given that there are less resources available. Um, there's a increased health and safety regulations. There's a supply chain shortage. Um, the board should consider availability of financial resources and uh, the customer situation. So the, dis the disaster plan needs to address matters such as employment availability, scheduling changes due to social distancing, um, employee, employee time off, um, functionality of the IT system and cybersecurity. This is important because many people are working from home, data privacy, confidentiality, cybersecurity breaches uh, is becoming very important. Um, the board should also consider communication protocol. Again, considering that people are working from home. And lastly, there's the legal and regulatory compliance. There are new laws and regulation that's imposed by local and federal authorities. And the, the disaster plan need to address these new laws and need to address the existing contractual obligation. Of course, if there isn't a crisis response plan, the board should set one up to assess and to respond to the pandemic. Um, so the second step in this crisis response program is to create or form a committee or a task force. So the committee and task force should include board members, members of management and advisors, such as lawyers, accountants, even cybersecurity consultant, whoever the board deems is appropriate. Uh, we may want to use outside advisors if there's a specific issue that needs to be addressed. For example, I'm on the board of a nonprofit, and after we received 
uh, the PPP loan, the Paycheck Protection Program, we created a special committee to advise the board on how to use the PPP loan. We hired an outside accountant who specializes in nonprofit spending to advise us how we should spend uh, the funds to allocate the maximum amount of loan forgiveness. The committee and special task force should include individuals with diverse background and expertise to ensure all aspects of the pandemic and its effect on the business are covered. Um, the board should be mindful that it is the ultimate authority that it is the ultimate authority in connection with responding to the pandemic. The board can assign and create committees to assist, but, but the board needs to monitor the effect of the pandemic or address one or more risks to the business. Um, so the board can assign or delegate some of the responsibility, but at the end of the day, it's the board that's the ultimate decision maker. So why why should the board delegate or create a committee? Well, with a with a small committee, um, they're more efficient in evaluating, overseeing, or addressing certain risks to the company. The committee uh, needs timely and sufficiently detailed minutes and resolution. The committee should document the proceedings and actions of the committee and provide evidence of the activities or conduct, the matters considered, and what decision the committee made. And then the committee would then provide this finding to the board. If the committee declines to adopt any measure considered, we will need um, clear, clear records showing um, good faith effort in the committee's effort to evaluate such measures. <clears throat> So in discharging its responsibility, the board must implement measures to ensure that it's reasonably informed of the business and operation of the company. Thank you for that overview, Min. Um, so what responsibility does the board have to manage the company's capital and what steps should they take to do it effectively? So as part of the general oversight duties during the pandemic, the board should receive periodic updates from management with respect to companies' uh, liquidity and capital consideration. So specifically with COVID, the board should understand and evaluate the impact of the pandemic on the financial strength of the company. For instance, the board needs to monitor the company's cash and anticipated cash need for working capital, future debt payments, maintenance of um, financial covenants and loan, loan agreements. So after considering the capital and expenses, the board should consider whether changes to the business or policy of the company are necessary in response to anticipated cash needs. Um, in looking at anticipated cash need, the board should consider whether it's appropriate to delay declaring dividends or if dividends have already been declared, whether the payment of such dividend can be delayed. Um, many companies are also considering compensation changes to save capital. Um, so companies are changing compensation and incentive, including those of executive. There are pay reduction, um, but when, when you do that, you need to consider the effect on the executive agreement. Sometimes the employment agreement has a severance pay and that can be triggered by pay reduction, giving the executive the ability to quit and to get um, generous severance. It, it's important to note that if the company becomes insolvent, insolvent or enter um, the possibility of insolvency, their obligation and duties of the board um, increases to not just the members of the board, but to creditors and other constituents of the company. Um, 
Ne next slide, please. So um, how do we plan for disruption to the operation and business um, and business relationship? I'm sorry, can we get to the, can we go back to the previous slide? Thank you. Um, evaluating business and operational disruption. So the board and management need to consider the impact of COVID-19 on key customers, suppliers, um, financing and service providers. So the board either the board either themselves or through a task force need to review key contracts to identify any potential issues relating to force majeure that may trigger defaults or termination rights um, related to the contract terms. There could be a task force to look into government help through emergency government funds or other programs initiated um, because of COVID. Companies can also reassess the ad adequacy of their insurance coverage and whether or not their insurance coverage would cover business interruption. And if so, what are the proper steps to preserve any potential claim for when the business was forced to close? The board should consider implementing a detailed emergency succession plan that takes into account the unavailability of directors, officers, or key managers of the company. Um, because it's COVID, one of these key directors, officers, key managers could be sick and someone would need to take over. Um, the board should consider establishing a COVID-19 transition team that serves on the governing body to carry out the necessary changes in company leadership. The transition team can help define the responsibility and roles for acting management and coordinate directors, supervision and support. Um, in, in extreme cases, you, the company should check the bylaws. There may be an emergency bylaw um, the board should consider having an emergency bylaw that would become operative, operative during an emergency. Um, such bylaws would list officers and other person designated on a, a approved list so they can have a special meeting and call everybody on that list. Great, thank you so much for that background, Min. Um, Nishita, what should companies consider related to performance metrics and targets for their stock options during this time? Thank you, Shasha. So most of the com your companies have already set their 2020 incentive plan uh, performance targets before March 2020 and before the pandemic was declared. As the ripple effect of the COVID-19 continues to inflict economic cost on the companies, Many companies are concerned that their incentive plan or performance targets may now be unattainable. Further, due to the increase in the uncertainty associated with COVID-19, motivating and retaining executive talent is a significant concern. Despite uh, these uncertainties, companies have to continue to incentivize and retain their top talent and may need to take action to ensure that the performance goals can be met. Now, depending on the company's compensation structure and at the same time uh, continuing to protect the shareholders' interest, companies have considered uh, various options, including uh, maintaining their existing incentive performance uh, targets in spite of the present circumstances. Some companies have made adjustments to the performance targets based on the current available information. You know, some companies have adopted a wait and see approach until the impact of the pandemic is cleared before revising the performance targets to avoid the risk that 
adjust a adjusted target will be deemed too soft to the uh, to the shareholders. Some companies have adopted a wider range of metrics that include uh, non-financial operational goals, focus on the increased efficiencies, departmental goals, etc. While some companies have split their original uh, performance period uh, into smaller periods so that the appropriate goal goals can be established on a short term basis. And also uh, splitting the performance period and, and setting new targets uh, uh, for each uh, performance period. And some companies have just extended the time to achieve uh, the targets. Any change in the incentive plan, including the performance target, amount, timing, will have to be considered in light of the contractual obligation under the existing incentive plan performance plan. Before making any amendment to the incentive plans, it is highly recommended that the company should review their compensation plan documents to confirm the extent of the authority required to revise the established performance criteria. The company should also consider the legal implication amendment that affect the, the particip that affects the participants may require their consent. The company should also consider tax implication, whether the proposed modification will violate uh, deferred compensation rules, section 409A of the IRS. The company should also consider accounting implication, whether the modified aggregate fair value of the revised award will be treated as liability. And the companies also need to, to um, to disclose the whatever the changes they propose to to the shareholders. In a nutshell, a proper realistic performance based compensation plan that align personnel needs and their interest of the shareholders will help companies navigate the current uncertain environment. Thank you, Shasha. Thanks very much for that, Nishita. And as companies face the possibility of devalued stock prices, Min, could you talk a little bit more about takeover defense strategies? Yes, thank you, Sasha. We are anticipating an increase in merger and acquisition cases. <clears throat> to protect from unwanted merger and acquisition, the board needs to assess if the company have a poison pill on the shelf, <clears throat> which pretty much means that they're ready um, to adopt this plan. If the board says go ahead and do it, it's advisable. A poison pill is a defense tactics used by company to prevent or discourage hostile takeover. It allows existing shareholders the right to purchase additional shares at a discount if one shareholder buys a certain percentage or more of the company's share. So for example, the plan would be triggered if one shareholder buys 20% of the company's share. At that point, every shareholder, except the one who has 20%, would have the right to buy new shares um, at a discount. If, if every other shareholder is able to buy more shares at a discount, such prices would dilute the bidder's interest and the cost of the bid would rise substantially. So knowing that such plan could be activated, the bidder would look elsewhere and not necessarily want to take over the corporation without the board's approval. Um, they would first negotiate with the board in order to avoid the poison pill. Um, consider the company's takeover preparedness and what steps should be taken in response to the vulnerability of hostile activity resulting from a depressed stock price. So the board should consider this on a regular basis. And uh, the board should also use the assistance of investment bankers and outside counsel to assist with the analysis for the, the stock share prices. Um, back to you, Sasha. 
Thank you, Min. Um, Vikram, how can companies reevaluate their long-term corporate strategy amid COVID-19? Thank you, Sasha. Um, I hope everyone's doing well today. Yes, yeah, so I'm here to talk about reassessing long-term corporate strategy in light of the pandemic. Now, undoubtedly, as we all know, the pandemic has brought new and unique challenges to most, if not all, businesses. So it forced, it's been forcing businesses to focus on the critical functions of their operations as that would take priority. However, once the critical areas of need are addressed, the board may want to consider implications as it relates to long term corporate strategies in light of the changing environment caused by COVID-19. Some of these may include um, cultivating new alliances, developing more innovation and technology such as cloud computing, cloud security, you know, Zoom meetings are very popular, growing through acquisitions or disposing of non-core assets and businesses. Uh, we all saw the merger between Livongo and Teladoc, and there is an anticipated merger with Microsoft uh, and, and Walmart acquiring TikTok. Companies are also exploring lower cost financing structures, developing new employee benefit plans and benefit plans that may take COVID into consideration and evaluating real estate needs because a lot of employees nowadays are working remotely. We know a lot of the big tech companies here in the Bay Area like Google and Facebook have already given permission to a lot of their employees to work remotely. So it makes co corporations wonder, hey, do we need to spend all this rent money on commercial leasing space if everyone wants to work from home? Also, companies and employees are engaging in more Zoom meetings and teleconferences, and perhaps a lot of corporations are realizing the immense expense and wasteful expense that business trips are. So, you know, maybe business meetings will be conducted in a whole new way moving forward as well. Back to you, Sasha. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for that overview, Vikram. Um, and as things are constantly changing during the pandemic, communication is of paramount importance. Esther, can you cover a little bit more about how boards strengthen, can strengthen their communication systems during this time? Sure, thank you, Sasha. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm very glad to, to talk about the shareholder communications and about what steps can a company take to prepare for the possibility of shareholder activism in the current environment. So basically, it's really important, especially in this pandemic. So um, then uh, there are three perspectives that, that the company really need to consider. The first is environmental, um, the, sec uh, sorry, yeah, the second is social, and the third is governance factors. So these three factors may offer the investor the potential long-term performance advantage. So during the, 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 uh, the, the communication, the shareholder discussions should always cover uh, several different things. Things. Um, for example, it can contribute uh, talk about the contribute to efforts to keep their community safe. Um, for example, like uh, you know, post uh, uh, updates on the, the website and to keep everyone um, on the same page. Um, or you know, how and when to bring employees back to work. So uh, create some new policy and to make sure that the, the employee are uh, on the same page and will be fairly disclosed uh, the risk of their approach to the, the employees. And for, for example, another way is different approaches for talent development and backup plans when senior executive or director become ill. So it's really important that the communication should be clear, simple and frequent and keep everybody um, posted regularly and ensure that everybody, you know, everyone gets relevant information quickly um, by creating a routine or system so it will be updated regularly. So it's really important for the communication so everybody can check the, the updates and to make sure what kind of goal and achievement um, the company is pursuing. Thanks, Sasha. Back to you. Thanks so much, Esther. And um, could you also provide an overview of what companies should be aware of as they consider remote board and shareholder meetings? 
Sure, thank you. Um, it's really important because during the COVID-19 in a lot of or I can say in most of scenario, it's impossible to um, for the board meeting to be held in person face to face. So that's the reason why a lot of clients ask what about the virtual meeting? So that's the point the virtual meeting kick in. The board should always consider whether it is advisable for it um, during this pandemic to meet one on, you know, on a very frequent basis just to ensure that the board is properly overseeing the business. So because of this, like I said, it's kind of be impossible for everyone to meet at a physical location. So then the, the question is, uh, whether it's allowed to have this remote board meeting. So then there are four perspectives that I would like to discuss and share. The first is about the state law. The corporate laws of many states actually expressly permit the boards and the committees to meet by phone or other electronic means. So for example, in Delaware, um, it's, you know, uh, for the virtual meeting only is allowed, but uh, uh, up to now, the, the New York doesn't have very specific rules saying, um, you know, the, the only virtual meeting is allowed. So it always depends on state by state. So before you hold a, a remote board meeting, you always need to go back and to check the state law. Uh, in addition to the state law, um, the company also need to check the governance documents, uh, for example, as bylaws and operating agreements, because bylaw is very important and has listed all the principles and ways to, to run the business, including the, the board meetings. So in the most of bylaws, there was specified the place and the time of the meeting, but always it also will be a leeway for everyone. Just say as the board members see fit and they can choose when and where and in which methods. So in that case, if bylaw allows, then you know the notice requirements is also should be considered carefully because the purpose behind the, the board meeting is allowed everyone to be heard well and to be prepared and to participate actively. So if the meeting were conducted by telephone or other electronic means, the notice must identify the such mode and the time and maintain a chat box and allow the board member to participate and be heard well. So if you will discuss or review the documents during the meeting, you also should prepare in advance to make sure that everybody has the chance to talk about and review it. So it's really important. Um, in many cases, members of the board uh, may also waive notice requirements by attendance at the meeting or by signing a written waiver. But just to be safe, a proper notice is always required. But however, it's generally not possible to waive a, a quorum because quorum is the essence of the meeting. So basically, you cannot waive that. Um, the second part is about annual shareholder meeting. I think actually they shared a very the same um, concept and the, the same purpose as the remote board meeting. So annual shareholder meeting is also very important as to notice. So then because in the, the COVID-19 and uh, uh, again, it's impossible to have it in a physical location. So there are also several options for the company. The company may change its you know, meeting date or if the applicable law allows to hold a virtual meeting of shareholders. So the business should always review their governing documents and state law just to confirm they have the corporate authority to permit shareholder to attend meeting remotely. Um, and also some good idea is some company may provide hybrid meeting, namely in person meeting and virtual meeting. So as I said, uh, another option is delayed in person meeting. So in that scenario, uh, the company always need to check the bylaws and to see whether there's any specific place and date stipulated in it. So a change in meeting date may also require a notice obligation under the applicable state law. Um, so it's really important to be note uh, to notify the, the, the shareholder well um, and also note that the corporate laws of many states have been amended in response to the pandemic. So to expressly permit company to hold a virtual meeting. 
So if a company desired to hold a me meeting of shareholder virtually, but has already provided notice for an annual meeting of shareholder, so then it's really important to update a notice and to make sure everybody is notified well. So perhaps with a supplement to the original notice is required. But it also it's, you know, in many instances, it will also necessary for the company to provide a new notice of the meeting if there is a change or material change. And then uh, you also need to specify the ways and the time and the methods to make sure everybody can can be heard well and that they have access to the meeting. So um, I think that's it. Um, thanks. Back to you, Sasha. Thank you very much, Esther. All right, well, it looks like we don't have any questions, but um, feel free if you have any questions that do pop up for you after watching this webinar, we have our attorney's contact information on screen. And you can also send us an email to info at chug.com. We want to thank everyone for attending our webinar today, and we wish everyone the best during this time. Hope you have a wonderful week ahead. Thank you.